what what is it about humanity that 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 it wants to go to the, all the details and stuff and listen? You know, these guys like Fauci get up there and start talking. You know, he doesn't know anything really about anything, and I'd say that to his face, nothing. The man thinks you can take a blood sample and stick it in an electron microscope, and if it's got a virus in there, you'll know it. He doesn't understand electron microscopy, and he doesn't understand medicine. He, doesn't, he should not be in a position like he's in. Most of those guys up there on the top are just total administrative people, and they don't know anything about what's going on at the bottom. You know, Those guys have got an agenda, which is not what we would like them to have, being that we pay for them to take care of our health in some way. They've got a personal kind of agenda. They make up their own rules as they go. They change them when they want to. And they smugly, like Tony Fauci, does not mind going on television in front of the people who pay his salary and lie directly into the camera. So this is something that uh, I mean, I, it, it's I, I thought would have been well known among infectious disease professionals, but uh, but in some 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 ways early in the epidemic, it, it got confused. Um, so when when the epidemic started, the World Health Organization put out a report that said, uh, in fact, a news a huge news conference saying that that, that the uh, fatality rate from uh, from the virus was three point four percent. There are published papers in the Journal of American Medical Association saying the fatality rate was two point two percent. How do you calculate that? Well, the, the way that they calculated that is they counted it actually mostly from the Chinese data because that the, it hit uh, the, the disease obviously hit in China first. Uh, they looked at the number of deaths, they looked at the number of people that were identified as as having had the disease, and that's your fatality rate, right? It, it seems simple, it seems easy. A lot of a lot of people uh, sort of tried to play with the data to produce some numbers like that. The problem is that that's incredibly misleading, and the reason why is. The virus has a very wide range of clinical manifestations, ranging from basically no symptoms whatsoever to mild symptoms, all the way up to the horrible, deadly viral pneumonia that sort of caught, caught everyone's attention in, uh, in you know a year ago. Um, and so I did. I conducted, uh, or I was a senior author on. There's a huge teams of people that conducted um, uh, the uh, three seroprevalence studies: one in Santa Clara County, uh, one in Los Angeles County, and then a, a major league baseball study. What we found was that that there were 50 times more infections than cases, 40, 50 times more infections than cases in both both California uh, counties. Um, and this is in April, April of 2020. The, the idea that we could test our way out of this and trace back at that point became ridiculous, right? You can't test and trace when, the, when you're missing 50 to one. No matter how extensive your testing regimen is gonna be, you're not gonna catch all those infections. Um, it also has it implies, as you asked, and, and it's an excellent question, that the infection fatality rate is much lower than the the three point four percent number that the World Health Organization said. Uh, or case the, fatality rate, yeah. Yeah, that those are yeah. the case fatality rates. Those are misleading. Those are the among the people who are identified as cases. How many of them die? But they're, I mean, that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. The infections are are fifty times more, at least in the early days of the epidemic. Our estimate was that. Uh, in the in in California in April 2020, um, the infection fatality was 0.2%, two in a thousand. Um, this was you know tenfold less than what, uh, what what was being reported in the literature for the case fatality rate, of course. Um, and we also found the same age gradient, that steep age gradient. Um, the the uh, uh, there are now at about a thousand of these. Uh, thousand, there's about a hundred of these studies, more than a hundred. I've lost count. I've stopped counting um, of these studies worldwide, and the estimate that we got is about the median estimate. The median infection fatality rate worldwide is about 0.2 percent, roughly exactly what we found in April of 2020. I, I, I think it's not that COVID is 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 a 
uh, is a benign thing. There are some cases of myocarditis with COVID. There are neural uh, uh, infections that sometimes happen with COVID. That you know, people lose their their sense of taste and smell. Some some people, and, and, and for some people, it takes a very long time to come back. It absolutely can have these effects. The question is, how frequent are they? The evidence. Um, I mean, even early on, looked like it was more anecdotal than than systematic. Absolutely, and yeah. People used it to scare others. Like the, uh, another one is is this is this uh, Kawasaki's like thing. It's called MISC now, uh, 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 multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. Um, mm, mm. So there, there again, uh, Dr. Fauci used it to scare the population about ch their children getting severely ill if they get COVID. The problem is the denominator. The, the, uh, it is very, 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 very unlikely that your child will become very, well, you don't have children, but like I, my children will become very, 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 very ill um, if they should get uh, if they should get COVID. But as clinicians, we should be cognizant that these things exist. And uh, and and of course, as scientists, we should be studying them and, and seek ways to, to address them. Um, but as public health people, we should not be scaring the public with them, at, at pretending as if they're common when they're not, just to keep the public in uh, uh, in line with the with the current policy environment. So, so just to give give some sense of this, just I mean, I, I'm going to just pick the, the things that, uh, that I, I have focused on because they've just shocked me. And you know, I, I imagine you'll you'll you have your own. Um, in June of this past year, uh, the CDC did a survey, a nationwide survey, and found that one in four young adults, 18 to 24 year olds, seriously considered suicide in the United States this past June. The the depth of psychological damage from this lockdown is almost unimaginable. Uh, I think I just saw a survey: one in three experienced symptoms of either depression or anxiety. Uh, the, the, the the psychological harm is almost unimaginable. We're, I mean, I, 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 I've seen statistics that we've run out of inpatient psychiatric beds for adolescents um, and, and, and youth uh, in, in New York. Uh, the, 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 the stories of child suicide is just, I mean, just as young as nine years old. Um, I mean, I, I, think it's, I think these are all lockdown harms. These are all directly attributable to this idea and, and the guilt that we placed on children to, to not spread the disease, the, this isolation we forced on them so they can't play with each other or, or interact with each other in normal ways. Think about the schools themselves. There's a study that was published in the Journal of American Medical Association that uh, that the, the closure of schools just last spring will cost children five and one half million life years in the United States in expectation over their lifetime. Uh, the, the, the reasoning is very simple. Uh, children that, that uh, don't have complete schooling with less schooling they live shorter less healthy less wealthy lives schooling is very very important as an investment in, in human capital um, and in health capital uh, there's that the economic language that that hides a, a, a incredible incredible right effect, which is that schools are just hugely great things for children um, not just while they're in school but their entire lives um, th and Stopping school for even a little while can have enormous negative consequences in the lives of children for, for, for their entire life. Five and a half million life years, according to the public, a study published in JAMA. Children do not seem to pass the virus on very efficiently to other people. Yeah. There was yeah. an early incredible study done in Iceland, which was which is a, a fantastic study uh, uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, in, I think it was April, I mean, early, early on. What they found was an absolutely astonishing finding. I think utterly unexpected. At least I didn't expect it. Um, which is that the, that not a single case of they found of a child passing the virus to an adult. For older people, uh, the, uh, the there's a, a twenty percent increase uh, reported last year in deaths from dementia. Dementia means you you know is a, is a condition where you uh, where essentially it's slow forgetting of your of yourself. An Alzheimer's disease is an example of this. Um, uh, 20%. We've been, uh, in many ways isolated our seniors so extremely, in some pla some cases where they they die of uh, neglect. Um, in Quebec, they they they're actually in the early days of the epidemic, um, of the the folks who some folks who worked in care homes abandoned their posts, and the 
elderly people that they were supposed to, to care for died of starvation. Uh, I, I said there's health harms. There are. Uh, we've skipped uh, routine vaccinations for children. We skipped screening for cancer. So women uh, are skipped mammograms last year. Men and women skipped uh, colonoscopy uh, or, or you know sort of colonoscopies to check for colon cancer last year. Colon cancer screening last year. We're going to have many more women with face, uh, stage four breast cancer this year that should have been picked up last year. And they'll have much worse outcomes as a result. And, and a lot of it was completely avoidable. We scared people so that they were more scared of COVID than cancer, um, which is uh, which is crazy. Internationally, it's absolutely devastating. Uh, you know, uh, the UN in May, I think it was April or May of last year, put a report out that, uh, that they expected a, an additional 130 million people to, to be at risk of starvation um, there, uh, uh, this 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 past year. I mean, like 70 percent of of of, uh, of households in poor countries report uh, so, some some level of food deprivation. I mean, we're we're starting to see this come out. 90 million additional ch children in poverty worldwide. 168 million children. Uh, who have uh, lost a, a substantial time in school. Um, I mean, it, it just, it, the, the, the litany goes on and on. Uh, the the uh, uh, tuberculosis treatment programs, which are hugely important because tuberculosis is such, such a deadly and widespread disease. Uh, malaria control programs were stopped. Uh, uh, polio, which was sort of on the verge of extinction. Um, well, now, it, now. That, um, in Pakistan, it, it's, it's, um, it's one of these it's one of these things where like we decided that we were going to control this one risk we face covid and we forgot that we face an enormous number of other risks I mean, we, it's, a, it's a huge dereliction of duty as far as public health is concerned as opposed to like thinking broadly and holistically about the health risk that that the human population faces and and, and sort of there's trade-offs implicit in all of it uh, we decided that we we're going to only focus on one risk panic and the population around it I think the, the the idea that this COVID risk is more important than any other uh, thing that anyone else on Earth values is was was an, it was and is a, a an enormous mistake, right? So actually, I've seen the economists make this mistake. The idea is that well, let's solve the epidemic first, and then we can get back to our normal life. Um, I, I think that it's that's an incredibly short-sighted view. It's almost Orwellian, right? This this idea that you have um, an essential class whose job is to provide for the for the needs of the non-essential class. Um, it's 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 a very, very strange kind of, uh, of of language to say, look, you go take the risk, you the essential worker uh, of the virus to serve me so that I can I can protect myself. And we see yeah. incredible inequality sort of exposed as a consequence of the lockdown policy. The lockdowns, like I so I don't. It's the first story, I don't think they've been particularly effective. Um, one good example of this is if you compare Florida and California. All right, so the number of cases to date of COVID nineteen in California is is and and Florida is actually higher in California. More cases to date in California than in Florida, even though California has been locked down basically continuously for uh, uh, since March of last mm. year. Um, co uh, whereas Florida has been open like two thirds opened in May and then fully opened in September of last year. Uh, Disney World is open, Disneyland is closed, right? Uh, and yet Florida has fewer cases per capita than California. In California. Um, and uh, to date, the death rate is a little bit higher in Florida, but they also have a much older population. Uh, their age adjusted death rate is lower. The The probability of dying if you're old in, Cal in Florida is lower from COVID than, than in California, despite the lockdown. In California, lower. Uh, same thing for young, right? So for both young and old, lower COVID death rates in Florida than in California. Um, it's just that Florida has more old, so the, their death rates are higher as a result of a higher uh, fraction of old. Uh, right. And, and, and so age-adjusted death rates are lower in Florida. The lockdown. What did it accomplish for California in terms of protection for COVID? It, it seems like it, was, it, it, it didn't accomplish much. Um, whereas in Florida. They've been open. I think that the lockdowns were were I mean a, an enormous experiment, 
right? The, the, we actually have never tried anything like this on this scale before. Uh, I mean, I think there's some 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 experience with lockdowns during the 1918 flu, but it lasted very a much shorter time than a year, um, and it was relatively geographically limited. Uh, I mean, I think the the um, uh, the 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 ethics of it. Uh, I mean, I, I just I I can't see how you can look at this and say that it was an ethical thing to do. Um, the, the 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 pre-pandemic plans did not envision this. Uh, the the so so and and, um, and 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 in a way the the uh, the the, the wide-scale adoption of them with almost no evaluation whatsoever or discussion about their costs is sh absolutely shocking to me. Like standard practice in public health is that when you adopt a measure, you consider both its costs and benefits. We adopted the lockdowns with an argument about a, a tenuous argument about its benefits, with no discussion whatsoever about its costs. My name is Fong Fan. I'm the general manager at Catlin's Nail Spa. We also have a partner here. And we're in a nail salon. So in cosmetology, that means that we specialize in hands and feet and taking care of it. Opened in 2011, um, right after or during the recession, I suppose. And uh, we've been building up a, a small, very local clientele ever since. Most businesses had to close down, including mine, for unless we're, you know, because we're not an essential business, which is fine, you know. So there was like a two month period where we had no income and our employees had no income unless they you know collected unemployment or things like that as a small business we can't collect unemployment we could get loans that were forgivable we could get um eventually we got the ppp protection but like i said you know it affected every business so you know we obviously had some financial issues as well but we were able to manage through them uh, it's been slower obviously clients uh, we've had to do a lot of modifications to the salon, as you can tell. We've had to institute a lot of safety features. I've, I know a lot of small business owners. You know, obviously, most of them in the same field, some in similar fields, and you know, a lot of them have been struggling even more than us. We've been doing okay by comparison. A lot of people had to think about selling their business, closing down their business. A lot of people lost a lot in this situation. A lot of businesses didn't know what to do. You know. Their customers couldn't come in, they couldn't operate, they were going out of business. Even when they could open again, there were restrictions, a lot of um, issues logistically, financially. Small businesses make up the majority of business in America, not to mention the majority of the middle class. You know, it would really hurt the you know the long-term health of the U of the U.S. and of our economy if you know businesses are closing down like they did during this pandemic again you know they got to really think about what should we do in the future this hit people in more ways than the the one that they thought it would hit which was going to be the health you know i mean it just hit the the public it hit the the economy it hit everything and the um i don't quite i don't know how they quite decided what was essential and what was not they stepped up and said, okay, yeah, you are essential, you need to come back to work. It only took them three days for us, but it took them months for other places. And by the time that happened, they were gone. There was no way for them to come back. You know, um, some of these smaller companies, I mean, this company here, we go out of our way to do small business. I mean, that's a big thing for us, small business. With small businesses, there's a lot of them gone. The thing that I learned like back in 1968 when I first published a paper by myself in Nature in a field that I had no expertise in at all, uh, there are no old wise men up there at the top of science, where, which I would have, I really did until 68, I would have thought, you know, if you try to publish a dumb paper in a journal like Nature, it won't get published. But if you try to publish a good paper in there like I later tried to pu publish PCR, the invention of PCR, in the same journal, and uh, they didn't take it. So it's up there. There isn't an up there there. There's no place up on the. There's, the Academy of Science is just a bunch of idiots, just like everybody else. You know, the editors of journals, austere journals even, they're just busy with their little lives and stuff. There are no 
old wise men up on the top, making sure that we don't do something really dumb.